Venerable Children is an American Buddhist nun and the founder of an abbey of Swarovski Abbey, a Buddhist monastery in Portland, Washington, USA. Ordained since 1977, she is a student of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Zenzab Sekong Rinpoche, and several other Tibetan lamas. She has authored many books on Buddhist philosophy and meditation and is currently assisting His Holiness the Dalai Lama with the writing and publication of the Library of Wisdom and Compassion, a 10 plus volume series on the entire Buddhist path. Please visit tuktanchildren.org for a media library of her teachings and swarvastiabbey.org to learn more about the Abbey. While we are waiting for Venerable to, to, to uh, come in and join us, uh, now I'd like to invite Venerable Sam K to lead us in chanting of the Shakyamuni Buddha Mantra. Venerable Sam K. I mune mune maha mune ye soham. Tai ata mune mune maha mune ye soham. Tai ata mune mune maha mune ye soham. Tai ata hom mune mune maha mune ye soham. Tai ata hom mune mune maha mune ye soham. Tai ata hom mune mune maha mune ye soham. Tai ata hom mune mune maha mune ye soham. Brothers and sisters, three prostrations to venerable, please. Okay. Good. So, it's nice to see all of you. Um, yeah. It's, it's an international group, but I see lots of people from Singapore and lots of people from Malaysia, which is really nice. So I quite appreciate all of you coming um, to hear the teachings. So this evening, we're going to talk about um, COVID and the effect that COVID has had on us, uh, not only physically had, but especially as a society or as individuals within that society. Yeah, but first we're just gonna sit for a minute and uh, calm our mind and generate our motivation and we'll get into the talk. Okay, so I, I can say one effect of COVID is that now everybody looks at screens, not as individuals, at live people. So even the people sitting in this room are watching it on the screen and I'm sitting right in front of them. <laughs> so we've gotten, you know, like a screen is uh, better than, than the real person. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, so let's just take a minute, come back to your breath, let your mind settle.
and let's cultivate our motivation. And recall that as one individual, in one way, each of us is very important. And in another way, we aren't important. So important, we're important in the sense that we have the potential to become fully awakened beings. And that what we do matters. It influences other people. And one person can change the course of history and influence many people in a good way or in a way that where they are oppressed and denied their freedom. So in that way, each of us is important how we interact with others. In another way, it's helpful to see ourselves as not very important because when we see ourselves that way, then we don't take offense about so many things. We are not so ego sensitive to how people are treating us. And so that allows our mind to be more relaxed and more peaceful. So we have to hold these, both of these together, that we are important in one way, and we're not important in another way. But both of those ways can converge in the bodhicitta, the aspiration for full awakening. And so may we all generate that very important motivation which makes our actions of body, speech, and mind very important. And in generating the motivation to be, to become a Buddha for the benefit of all beings, may we overcome our self-centeredness and realize that we're not as important as our self-centeredness thinks we are. And so in that way, may we open our heart to all living beings and have love and compassion for them. So let's make that our reason for sharing the evening or the morning, depending where you are. Okay, so I found the title of this talk rather interesting, Life After COVID, okay? As if, you know, life after COVID is now, uh, but we're not after COVID, we're in the middle of COVID, okay? And how life is going to be after COVID, uh, I... I'm not a fortune teller. I cannot tell you that. Okay. So we're going to look at some of the ways COVID has affected us, how we've respond, uh, we've responded, what are alternative responses to the situation. And then uh, hopefully we'll get to, uh, to talk about also how we've changed and how we've grown in a beneficial sense from this experience of living in a pandemic. So first of all, I think COVID has functioned to blow apart all of our expectations about how we think our life should be in 2020 and 2021. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, we often have so many expectations 
things are going to be like this, and they're going to be like this, this can happen, that's going to happen. And uh, did you ever think that you would live through a pandemic? Yeah, I the, the idea never entered my mind. I always thought pandemics, you know, like the bubonic plague that, that you know, happened centuries ago in, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a time in history where people were not so educated and sanitation wasn't very good. Uh, but pandemics now never entered my mind that I would be living through one. Okay, so this is a good teaching in our life, isn't it? How we have all these assumptions, all these expectations about how our life is going to be, how it's supposed to be, what's going to happen, uh, what is reasonable to happen in our life, what is not reasonable, and here, something we never even thought of is happening, and we're living in it, and there's no way we can get out of it. Okay, they haven't started the vacation pack packages to the moon yet. So whether you want to be in COVID or not, you don't have a choice. Okay, so that's one thing I think that has really uh, shocked people. You know, something they never anticipated happening. And because of so many people getting sick, it's affected so many areas of our life and our society. Okay. So I never, it never uh, entered my mind that the hospitals would be full, too full to take in new patients. Yeah. I mean, here, Malaysia, Singapore, you know, we live in countries that are developed. If you get sick, you, you know, seem to be able to get a, a hospital bed, no problem. But during COVID, that became a big problem. Yeah. And many people were sent back home because there weren't beds. Did you ever think that you would live through, we're coming on, I forget if it's two or three million casualties from COVID worldwide. I think it's three million, three million. Did you ever think that you would be alive when three million people would die by one illness. Yeah, and in the US, our death rate has been astronomical. You know, we're the, uh, what is it, the, um, we have a, a small percentage of the world's population, I think it was like 5% of the world's population. But at one point we had 24% of the deaths. Yeah. And for America, it's like the people woke up and said, oh, but wait, we're supposed to be the leader in the world. But now we're the leader of deaths. We're the leader of chaos. We're the leader of no plans to handle this pandemic at all. And I think that was rather shocking for Americans. Do you? Singaporeans, Taiwanese, uh, you people had, what was it, SARS. And I've noticed that because SARS was present in your countries, you made preparations, your governments made preparations for a pandemic so that when COVID struck, the government went right to work and started taking care of people. And I know in Singapore, the government was even giving out the masks in the early days 
um, you know, and people did what the health department advised to do. Yeah, it's true in Singapore, isn't it? I mean, people, they obey what the experts say. And the health department says, no, you know, stay at home and don't socialize. And you people follow what's good for you. And the government says, wear masks, and you wear masks, and nobody complains. Okay. Here in this country, ah, oh, yeah, it's like people have this idea of personal liberty that is really upside down. And they think personal liberty means you can do whatever you want to do. And that's not the liberty, what liberty means. Yeah, at least not by our founding mothers and fathers, you know, of the country, where liberty meant that you were free from the erratic and destructive behavior of other people so that you could live your life peacefully. So here, in response to being told to wear masks, yeah, we had protests. And in one state, Michigan, yeah, uh, uh, the people arrived with uh, military weapons at the Capitol, yeah, and walked into the Capitol uh, because they were so upset at being told uh, that they couldn't go out and they had to wear masks. So COVID, at least here, unlocked a whole lot of social problems that uh, had not been, they were there before, but it really brought them out. So I don't know how it was in Singapore and Malaysia if that happened, okay? Uh, I have a feeling if it did, it wasn't intense like what we went through, but, uh, and are still going through. <laughs> it hasn't stopped yet. So, you know, in this country, the relationship between the citizenry and the government began to be not so smooth there was a break of trust, yeah? The previous president uh, just said, it's a hoax, it's like the flu, nobody's gonna get sick, that sick, you'll recover, it's gonna go away, yeah? Remember last year in March, he said it was gonna be over by Easter? so that everybody could do all their Easter things together. So we were sitting here with the government lying to us about the state of the disease and its impact on people and uh, about our readiness to have the equipment that we needed to handle the hospitals being overloaded. Okay. so. This kind of social problem, again, you know, it was kind of there in America, but it really exploded because of the disease. And now, in some ways, for many of us, uh, faith in the government is being restored. We have a new president now. But for people who like the previous president, they don't feel that way now. And they feel like the government is trying to control them by asking them to wear a mask. It's very strange, very strange. Yeah, so I really admire the people in, uh, in Asia where you kind of listen to the experts that's, that's a very good quality, keeps people safe. Um, 
more ways that uh, the disease affected society, okay? Uh, of course, economically, and some uh, countries more than others, because so many people were ill, uh, or people were being on lockdown and told not to go out, then many people lost their jobs, production decreased, and the economy went south, okay? Something, again, that we probably didn't expect to happen, and there it went. Yeah, we had planned to start building the Buddha Hall last year, and then all of a sudden, within a few months, the economy went, Whoa! and there go our plans to start construction. So we're trying again this year. Yeah, we hope, you know, nothing interferes with it this time. But one thing we've really learned from the pandemic is, you know, not to have too many hard and rigid expectations. Because as soon as you do, life happens. And things that you didn't expect to happen, happen. And so we have to learn to be flexible and deal with them instead of reacting with, but it's supposed to be like this. Well, supposed to be doesn't matter. Yeah. In our lives, there are a few words that we say a lot that really don't matter. Supposed to be is, is one, one of those phrases. Things are supposed to be like this. Well, who said so? It's usually, well, me, I said so. But just because I said so doesn't mean it's going to be like that. Another word that we say a lot that is really it doesn't function very well is should. It should be like this. And it should not be like that. Well, what does should mean? You can say should and shouldn't all you want, and it doesn't change anything. Does it? You know, whether it's society should be like this, or, you know, my family member should not be like this. Whenever we say should, you know, it's like, well, good luck. The should doesn't make something happen. And it doesn't mean that, uh, yeah, it doesn't mean anything actually. Except it does make us mad. Because when we say should and things aren't like that, Well, how dare they not be like they should be? Yeah. Doesn't the world know how it should be? Don't my friends know how they should be? Well, obviously not. And obviously, should doesn't matter. Okay. So listen to how much you say should and shouldn't in your life. And then correlate that with how much you get upset about the way things are. Yeah. And try and, and leave those words out of your vocabulary. Should, shouldn't, supposed to, ought to be, better be. Okay. All these kind of judgments doesn't mean it's going to be like that. Okay, what else changed for us? Well, children uh, didn't go to school. And adults started working at home. Did that happen in Singapore? Kids stayed home? What about in Malaysia? 
The kids stay home from school too, yeah? Okay, so that really changed family dynamics, didn't it? Yeah, you're used to just spending a few hours with your kids and then you're not going to the office, they're not going to school. You're in one flat, which may not be very large, and you can't go out. And your kids are little and they want to run around, they're full of energy. And the only place they can run around is inside your flat because the parks are closed. And you're trying to do your office work so that at least maybe, hopefully, you can keep your job. And, you, you know, you're doing this, but the kids are like climbing the walls and climbing on top of you and, okay. So it creates some tension in the family. Yeah, you love your kids, but sometimes you want to scream, be quiet, sit there and do your homework and leave me alone. Yeah, I see some of you laughing. Yeah. That's what you wanted to say, isn't it? Yeah. So, and then there you are with your family members who you also love. Yeah, but so many people moved back in with their parents during COVID because they didn't have the money to keep their own flats. So there you are, 45, 50 years old, living with mom and dad again. Yeah. Now, I know in Asia, many people live with their parents when they're adults. And somehow, you seem to manage in some ways. It's not so often in the West. Yeah. And what I have noticed, and this kind of goes east and west, is that our parents always look at us as if we were babies. And in their minds, you know, they see this precious little innocent baby that they love to bits and they want to protect. So even if you're 45 and 50 living with mom and dad, yeah, they tell you to clean your room. They tell you what to eat and not eat. They tell you what to wear. They have comments about your friends. Okay. And you may chafe at that. Like, hey, I'm an adult. Give me some space. Yeah. And then now that you see yourself as adult, you want to tell them what to do. So they're still telling you what to do because they're seeing you as a baby. But now you're telling them what to do because older people don't do as well if they can't contract COVID. So mom and dad, don't touch that. Yeah, that could have COVID germs on it. So you tell your parents and you tell your kids. Yeah. And you tell your parents to wear a mask. And your mask has to cover your nose. It's not just over your mouth. Okay, but your parents' mask always kind of slips down so it's over here. Yeah, and your parents want to go out, out. They want to go out to eat. Yeah, they don't want to eat inside the house. Yeah, especially I noticed in Singapore, people go out to eat most nights. Yeah, because it's cheap and uh, the food is good. And so who wants to stay in the house? You know, your parents want to go out and you have to say, mom and dad, we're not going out. Okay. That's what your parents used to say to you when you were a teenager. Now you're saying it to them when they're old. So tensions happen in the family. Yeah. 
And we have to work with those tensions because not all of our family members do what we think they should do. Okay. Another thing that, it, that happened in, in the U.S., I'm not sure about Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. You people have, will have to tell me. But one thing that we discovered here that we kind of knew about before, but it became so obvious was the inequality uh, among citizens in the country. The economic inequality, the inequality of status, the inequality of how society as a whole cares for different stratas of the citizenry, or at least stratas of the residents in the country. Okay. So what we had here is some very wealthy people in New York moving out of the city because there was less likelihood you would get COVID if you were in a sparsely populated area than scrunched in the crowded, in a crowdedness of New York City. So the rich people could move out of the city to a second home or to a vacation, you know, vacation spot or something. Yeah, the people who had white collar jobs could work from home. They were protected from COVID because they could do all their work over computer and, you know, send it in and, and they didn't have to be at an office. The people who could afford it could order that their groceries and their groceries would be delivered to their doorstep. So they didn't even have to go out to the grocery store to get food. Okay, so the middle class, the white collar workers, the wealthy people, they had things that they could do to make their lives easier. Yeah, but many of the essential workers were people who were economically lower in a lower class and they did not have the privileges of the upper classes. So you find uh, people, the, the uh, people who were home health care aides, yeah, the people who were nurses assistants, uh, getting paid very little, but they were working in the hospitals or the old age homes, the nursing homes, or in people's private homes when people had COVID. So they were much more exposed to the disease than the people in the middle and upper classes. And even though they were in more jeopardy for getting sick, their wages were minimum. They were very poorly paid. Yeah, clerks in the stores. Yeah, the uh, people in the grocery store who unpack the groceries and put them on the shelves and check them out. Okay, uh, the people at department stores who, uh, you know, uh, put things on shelves and so on. The people who delivered the food the the people who transported the food yeah the people in in uh, restaurants who wash dishes who chop vegetables these people sacrificed a lot for the benefit of the entire society and yet they were in graver danger of contracting covid and they received less pay and all of a sudden, this inequality becomes so stark in the country that you can't ignore it. Yeah, the unfairness in a country 
where we talk about all citizens are equal, but all citizens are not equal. Okay. And uh, especially for the, um, the undocumented people here, the migrant workers, very difficult for them. They were terrified of going to the hospital if they were sick because they were afraid that the immigration authorities would arrest them at the hospital and import uh, ex, um, what? Deport them, not import them, deport them back to their own countries where it is dangerous for them to live and where they could easily be killed. Yeah, so this kind of inequality became so blatant, you know, it was very painful. And then in the middle of it, we had uh, a black citizen of the country, an African-American citizen, um, being murdered by the police. And so here we're in the middle of a lockdown with the disease raging and people are very upset and they're protesting in the streets. Okay, so I think you, did you see that on TV? Yeah, did you see what was going on here? Yeah, so it was really, it was very distressing, very, very distressing for everybody. Okay, so um, yeah, so everybody had all sorts of unexpected situations that they had to work with. Okay, this is what we call suffering, isn't it? You know, dukkha. That's why the Buddha's, the first of the four truths is dukkha. Our life situation is unsatisfactory. Yeah. And so COVID reminded us of that because we often space out. We go to Dharma talks. We hear about the four truths, dukkha, the origin of dukkha, the cessation, the path. It all sounds very good. Yeah. But I really want the teachings on life, love, and bliss. Okay. So, you know, not too much of this dukkha, unsatisfactory suffering stuff. You know, I want the, the, the teachings. Uh, you know, you know, when the lamas come and they ring the bells and they play the drums and they say all sorts of things in a language we don't understand. And all we have to do is sit there and we get blessed. <sighs> Yeah, so, you know, that's how people want, want to handle things, you know, isn't it? It's like, we want Dharma to be kind of entertaining. So these initiations and pujas, they're really kind of entertaining, aren't they? I mean, you have bells, you have drums, you have these vajras, you have the long horns, really long. You have the short horns. Yeah, then you have hats. My goodness, these lamas who come and do the pujas, they have all these different colored hats and lots of brocade, so much brocade everywhere. Okay. And big thrones. Yeah, you wonder if Queen Elizabeth's throne is as big as these llamas' thrones or not. Yeah. And so you turn to that, uh, you know, because who wants to think about dukkha and what the real origin of it is? Yeah. So, yeah you know, show all these things on the internet, then I can see all these kind of exotic things, yeah, without being exposed to COVID. And, uh, you know, and I still get blessed, even though I don't really get the blessed water, 
because it's on the screen. Yeah. And and the 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 strings. Yeah, these things. I I don't get them anymore because the llamas are on the screens. Yeah. So, well, what to do? Can't have everything. Okay. So what else happened? Lots of senior citizens died. Lots of grandparents, yeah, great grandparents in nursing homes, they died. Okay. And also middle-aged people died. And now young people are dying. The, the uh, variants are striking young people now, uh, young adults now, more than, than they used to. And so people are dying, and they're dying in ways that they're not supposed to die. Okay? Because the way people should die, supposed to and should, is they should be surrounded by their loved ones. They're not supposed to die alone in a hospital room where just to enter the hospital room, the doctors and nurses have to completely cover themselves in plastic garb. Yeah. They're supposed to be able to talk to their loved ones and say goodbye. And their loved ones are supposed to be able to visit them when they're dying and comfort them. And COVID took that away. And for many people, this compounds the grief of losing a loved one because they were not able to say goodbye. They were not able to comfort the dying person. Okay. And for the person who died, they felt really cut off from everybody else. And many of them died hooked up to ventilators. Yeah, when you're on a vent, uh, you're usually sedated because it's so uncomfortable. So you have that, you know, included with the whole process of dying. So I was reading one article recently that was saying that we're kind of like countries who are, uh, that are grieving, yeah? Because for each person who died, they say maybe nine new people are grieving when you talk about parents, grandparents, children, aunts, uncles, you know, for each person that dies, you have ten, uh, nine new people who are grieving. Yeah. In this country, we have, we have 560,000 deaths. Multiply that by nine, it's a huge number of people grieving. And so it's almost as if the whole country is in grief in one way or another, because everybody knows somebody who has died from COVID, or almost everybody knows somebody who has died from COVID. And if you don't know somebody who has died from it, you know somebody who's been quite sick, or you know somebody who maybe wasn't real sick, but they had it, and you were really worried about them because they could get very sick. Yeah. So here you have the citizenry for over a year of people grieving and worrying. So what is that, you know, what is the effect of that? 
Yeah. If we want to think of after COVID, yeah, well, what even about during COVID? How well are we dealing with grief and worry, let alone after COVID? Yeah. And so here, I think, is where spiritual practice can be so helpful, but where most people are at a loss at that time. They don't have a spiritual tradition or their spiritual tradition doesn't help them. Yeah. Or they, uh, their spiritual tradition is one where everybody wants to be together in the same room, but now due to health restrictions, you can't. So part of the big fuss in this country uh, was from many Christian practitioners because they wanted to be in church together and it was dangerous for them to be in church. They wanted to sing together, but singing put the virus into the air and made it more easily transmittable. Yeah, so it was very different, difficult for people who wanted to worship together. Many Christians, Catholics, evangelicals, also for the Orthodox Jews. Yeah, in those communities, just to have an, a, a, a worship service, you have to have 10 men. So to, for everybody to have to stay home, you know, then, you know, how can you worship if you don't have your quorum of, of 10 men? The women don't count. Okay, they're taking care of the kids and their husbands. Okay, so people are disrupted, you know, from uh, uh, turning to their religion in some ways. It, one thing that was nice about the Buddhist community is none of us complained about being on lockdown for that reason, because as a Buddhist, you can meditate on your own. You can chant on your own. You can do your practices on your own. Yeah, it's nice to do them with everybody else. But it's also a faith where we can, you know, function independently and where we don't rely on priests to connect us, you know, to the Buddha. We have a direct line to the Buddha. Yeah, we can uh, talk to the Buddha in our own words. We can seek the Buddha's guidance in our own words, we don't have to be in a temple. We don't have to be with other people. Yeah. So for the Buddhists, I think it, it was uh, easier for us in that way. Yeah. And what we found here at the Abbey was um, our online courses were now uh, like having huge numbers, well, for us, huge numbers of people attending. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, the Buddha, for the Buddhists, yeah, we want to hear teachings. And even for people who weren't Buddhists, they wanted to learn about Buddhism. So many new people started attending uh, online courses. It was really wonderful. So we felt very happy that we were able to give something to so many people in society who were grieving and who were worrying. Uh, and they were trying to find something that made sense to them and something they could practice. Yeah, so I think that was quite good. Don't you, the people here, you feel satisfied with what we were able to do? Yeah, I think it was, it went very well. And we're still doing that. Okay, really reaching out uh, nationally and internationally um, because people are really starting to question what is the meaning of my life? Yeah, and what does it mean to live a good life? 
And how should I, you know, how am I to relate to society now? Mm -hmm. And how am I to relate to death and dying? Mm -hmm. For many people in this country, again, I don't know if that happened in your countries or not, but um, the hospitals were very crowded and the morgues where they put the, the corpses after people die, they ran out of space in the hospitals. Yeah. So they had refrigerated trucks outside in the parking lot, one refrigerated truck after another. And each refrigerated truck had like these beds, like bunk beds. Yeah. But the bunk beds were so, were very close together. And on each one, they put a dead body in a body bag and they kept them refrigerated because there was no place inside the hospital to do it. Yeah. And so they were all kind of stacked up like that. And then many people uh, buried, not as individuals, but in mass graves in New York City, the potter's field. Many people, the family didn't claim the body or they were afraid to claim it because the person died of COVID. Yeah, and so then these bodies were buried by the state in kind of mass graves. Um, you know, this caused a lot of distress in people's minds um, because it, for Buddhists, it doesn't cause so much distress because we know that the body is not us, you know, and we've heard the Buddha's teachings of not to cling to the body. Yeah. But for people of other faiths or secular people, yeah, the, how the body is treated is very, very important. And now they couldn't have the usual funerals with the family around, they couldn't have, uh, you know, show the body, what did they call it, visitation? What? Viewings, yeah. The viewings where the family and friends can come and see the, the dead body. And, you know, that's actually quite helpful for the family and friends to accept the death when they can actually see it. But during COVID, they couldn't do that. Okay, that was quite hard on people. Yeah. So there were all sorts of things that weren't expected that all of a sudden people had to deal with. Okay. Um, you know, staying at home, you learn things about your family members that you didn't know before, maybe even about your spouses. Yeah, because you were with them 24-7. And not everybody is in a good mood 24-7. Yeah, but there's no place you can go. So you're with them. Yeah. So for some people, their relationships kind of disintegrated because they were in such close contact. For other people, their marriages blossomed because they finally had some time with their spouse to get to know each other and to do things together. And for some families, the relationship with the kids really flourished because, you know, instead of mom and dad rushing off to work and having very little time to spend with the kids, everybody was at home. And these particular families were able to, to really enjoy being with their kids and teaching their kids. So what you have is, the same situation and some people thrive in it and other people go nuts in it and get depressed. What's the difference between whether you thrive in a bad situation or you get depressed? What makes the difference? Is it in exactly what the external situation is? Or is it in the state of your mind? OK. 
Okay, so this is the question that I'm posing to everybody. Yeah, because we're still in COVID. So if you're happy, if you're unhappy, does is that dependent on the situation or it, does it also depend on your mind and how you view that situation and how you respond and interact with that situation? Yeah. So this is the, the question that uh, is one of the foremost questions that as Buddhists, we should be asking ourselves. Yeah? And if we ask, had asked ourselves this question before COVID, and if we had started to make adjustments to how we deal with difficult situations, then, you know, the limitations in, uh, in that we face with COVID would not be so bad because we would have already had some practice modifying our expectations, learning how to be friendly uh, to people, no matter how they treat us we would have some practice under our belt about seeing the benefits of difficulties. Yeah, because there's a whole genre of teachings in the in Buddhism. Yeah, about how to transform adversity into the path. Yeah. So if we'd practiced those before, we would be practicing them during COVID. If we hadn't heard of those teachings before or hadn't practiced them before, then COVID gives us the opportunity to listen to the teachings. Okay. So if you really take advantage of COVID, I mean, there's so many teachings online now. There's so many courses and retreats online. Yeah, and you can really learn uh, these teachings of the Buddha that are so incredibly helpful uh, to our minds and, and uh, tell us how to have a happy mind, even when the external situation can be difficult. Okay, now you're going, huh, how can that be? Okay, well... Yeah. How have you grown through COVID? How have you changed through COVID? Mm. Did somebody put some cold water in this? <laughs> half, half, okay. Um, so, you know, what have we learned? Through, through living through COVID? And what has the Buddha's teachings, uh, what do they tell us to do when we face difficulties? Okay. Well, if I, if I speak personally here, okay, I had uh, a hip replacement right smack in the middle of COVID. Okay. So right, actually the pain in my hip started right when COVID was coming into the country. Yeah, and I was having incredible pain um, from arthritis in my hip. And then I had to wait and, and have hip surgery, okay? It was my first time being put under. I had never been put under before. Um, but what I had learned from Buddhism about how to practice in situations, because I was in the hospital having to deal with surgery, but in the back of my mind wondering, are any of the other people around me on the ward contagious with COVID? Because they, they, they were supposed to keep all the COVID patients in other wards. But COVID is such that you can be a carrier and not be sick. Okay, or you can carry it and it's before you, you get ill. 
show thinking, are any of these people carrying COVID? Yeah. Are they sanitizing all the stuff that they're putting on me, you know, or in me? And so I just decided, you know, this is stupid to worry about. Worry has, does absolutely no good. It does not change any situation. It does not make me safer. Okay. I grew up with parents who worried a lot. They taught me worry is not worth it. Okay, you are so miserable when you worry and, and you can't do anything to remedy the situation. You just sit there biting your fingernails going, oh, what happens if this, what happens if that, what happens in this, you know? So I decided, okay, I'm not gonna worry about COVID while I'm in the hospital. And then after I came back, I had to go for physical therapy. So for several weeks, I was going into the hospital, our local hospital, twice a week to get physical therapy. So I sure could have worried about COVID there because our local hospital was, had some uh, COVID patients in it. I decided I'm not worrying about that. I am not gonna worry if my, if my therapist has COVID or if the other people coming in there for PT for physical therapy have COVID, I'm just gonna go. And, and what I focused on instead of ruminating about what if this and what if that, and, uh, what I decided and what I saw, what I actually saw, this was not a hard decision, was incredible kindness around me. The surgeon was kind. The nurses were kind. The people who made the bed in the hospital were kind. Venerable Jigme stayed in my room for 12 days sleeping. She didn't even sleep in a bed. She had to sleep in a reclining chair. And she had to deal with me for 12 days, you know? And I didn't want to stay in bed. I wanted to walk around and I wanted to do things, you know. So, um, and I kept forgetting to take my, my uh, medicine. And uh, we, we, we eventually got into a, a routine. We actually had quite a good time together. We had a lot of laughs. Um, but that was because I just said, I'm seeing kindness. Yeah. And I saw so much kindness, you know, everywhere. My physical therapist was so kind. You know, I had no idea what he thought about dealing with a Buddhist nun as a patient. It's not like there's a lot of Buddhist monastics in our part of the country. We live in an extremely conservative rural area, you know. And my therapist was great. He showed me all these exercises. He encouraged me, you know. And, uh, you know, every time I went in the hospital, they had to take my temperature and they asked me the same questions each time. But everybody was so nice. Yeah. And so what I, one thing I learned from COVID is that if I look, there's kindness all around me, you know? And when you see kindness, your mind is happy. Yeah. When you don't see kindness, when your mind is always going, yes, but it should be, it ought to be, it's supposed to be, then no matter what you have, the mind is miserable and dissatisfied. Yeah. But when you see kindness, then everybody is kind. Really kind of remarkable, you know? And uh, we, because we don't buy any of our own food, you know, people brought us food and they sent food to us. Yeah, so many people wrote us and they said, are you guys okay? 
you know, and then they would send us boxes of food. Uh, it was quite amazing. We were just looking at this, going, you know, like, wow. And we hadn't asked for anything. And there's like, you know, these cases of rice crackers and jam and protein powder and so many different things, yeah. So just the kindness of other people, yeah. That, you know, here we are, you know, in, in a rural area and people sent offerings and they drove up here in the middle of the pandemic to deliver offerings. Yeah. And the, the UPS people, the delivery trucks, you know, they came up and, you know, delivered all sorts of stuff. And we were just floored by it. I mean, we, we kept just sitting here being so amazed by the kindness people were showing us. Yeah. So, you know, at least one thing I learned from it is uh, be aware of what you pay attention to. Because what you pay attention to becomes your world. And if you pay attention to people, you know, dis who disagree with you and that bothers you because they have different opinions, then you're going to be really unhappy every time you try and have a discussion with somebody because they have a different opinion. Yeah, if you get unhappy because, you know, uh, and you're angry and upset because people aren't wearing masks when they should be, yeah, then you're going to be really unhappy. Yeah, when you can look at those people and say that they're afflicted by ignorance, yeah, it's not that they intend to harm others, they're afflicted by ignorance. They're afflicted by arrogance, thinking that they won't get COVID or that their family members won't get it. So instead of being angry at them, you know, it, accepting them, seeing them with compassion instead of with frustration and judgment. Okay, so this is a way of practicing that all of us can do. And it, all it takes is a change in our mind, in our attitude. So I just looked at the clock and it's 10 past eight here. And uh, in Singapore, I guess it's what, 10 past 11 in the morning. Anyway, the MC was gonna start speaking 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so Xiao Hong. Yes, uh, Barbara, we have a few questions for you. Okay, go uh, for it. The first <laughs> one is pertaining to dissemination of vaccine information and information related to COVID-19, especially if we are not so informed and we have some biasness. So the question is, should we then disseminate the information? And related to this question is about the vaccine. If we don't have confidence in the vaccine, and if we try to convince others not to take the vaccine, is it a non-virtuous act? How can we transform this mind? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're talking about ourselves. We're not talking about other people, right? Okay. So if you're somebody who doesn't believe in the, that the vaccine works, Okay, then I think it's good if you do some research. Yeah, and uh, read what the experts put out. Don't trust the politicians. Yeah, scientists, doctors know more about how your body works and about health than politicians do. Yeah, than people on the, on the TV and the radio do, you know? People in the media, they are not experts in this field. We need to follow the people who know more than we do. So when looking at it, okay, 
Um, it seems now like the vaccine is working quite well. Yeah, the more vac people are vaccinated, those people are not getting sick. Okay, now you might say, but yeah, there's stories of people who have been vaccinated and still get COVID. But if you look at the statistics there, yeah, at least in America, there's about 77 million people who have been vaccinated and just a, a bit over 5,000 who have contracted COVID. So the percentage of vaccinated people who have gotten ill is very, very small. Okay, so are you more likely to get COVID by not getting the vaccine or by getting the vaccine? Yeah, you're more likely to get COVID if you aren't vaccinated. Okay, then people say, oh, well, they hear all sorts of false information. There was something going around here that stem cells from aborted fetuses were used in making the, the vaccine. And so they may be in the vaccine. All sorts of crazy, crazy ideas, okay? But if you listen to the people who know, you know, they refuted those ideas. Yeah. And uh, I just remember, okay, I was born in 1950. When I, uh, when I was born, uh, polio was very widespread and parents were terrified of their kids getting polio. Because if you got polio when you were little, I mean, you were crippled your whole life. They discovered the polio or, or the salt, salt, you know, developed the, the polio uh, vaccine when I was, you know, in my early years. And all of the parents picked up their kids and took them to get the polio vaccine. There were no anti-vaxxers at that time. Nobody doubted it. Everybody was like, oh, thank goodness there's a vaccine for COVID. Our kids, uh, for, for, for polio, our kids will be safe. Yeah. And so I grew up in an era where, wow, I felt very happy. You know, okay, you get a jab, but you know, we got jabs for for measles, polio, tetanus, what else? Mumps, you know, all sorts of, of things. And we trusted it and it worked. Yeah. So I don't know why. Uh, I don't understand why people are so skeptical now. Okay. So... Uh, I personally, personally speaking, would never discourage somebody from getting the vaccine. I would always encourage them to get the vaccine, you know, unless they have the doctor says that because of, you know, maybe they're sick already, they can't get it now or whatever. Yeah, but other than that, uh, I really encourage everybody, please get the vaccine for your own benefit and also so that as a society, we can reach herd immunity where the vaccine will eventually uh, die out and we won't have so many variants. Okay. Thank you very much. The second question is, pandemic causes uncertainty in the job market. And while I still have a stable job for now, my prolonged ill health, not caused by COVID, forces me to consider taking a short break from current job. I'm just worried that I may not be able to get a job with similar compensation. 
what is your advice, Venerable? Okay. Well, I can't really give you advice. I can make you make some comments. Uh, first of all, you could ask for a leave of absence. So you don't have to pay the, uh, paint the situation as either I stay in my job and I get sicker and sicker, or I leave my job and then I'm going to wind up in the streets. You don't have to pay, you know, you know, paint just two uh, options where both of them are horrible. You know, you could go and ask for a leave of absence so that you can, you know, be healthier and then return to your job. Or if your, bo if your boss says no, you know, and you, you need to be healthy, isn't being healthy by resting more important than getting money? If you aren't healthy and you die, it doesn't matter how much money you have. Okay, so take care of your health. And then, you know, you go look for another job afterwards. And, you know, you're a talented person. You have skills. The economy is turning around now. You will get a job. It may not pay as much as you want, but at least you're alive. And who cares Really, you know, if you get paid as much as you get paid before. Yeah, there's so many other things in your life that are more important than the amount of your paycheck. Yeah, please think about that. Because I think that's another thing that many people are questioning due to COVID, you know, is... I put so much emphasis on, you know, progressing up the corporate ladder and getting more money. And here is COVID and it doesn't matter how much money you have. Yeah, money does not prevent you from getting sick. Money does not make you well. Money is not the meaning of your life. Yeah, so many people are starting to question, well, what really is important in my life? Because now I don't, you know, it's impressed on me that I may not live until, you know, to be 3,004 years old, you know? And so I have to do what's important in the time I have a life. Okay, Rabbi, the next question is, we are used to working from home and now we have to adjust to commute to work. Feeling difficult to apart from our loved ones. How can we overcome this? Well, you see your loved ones after work, don't you? Yeah. So you have to go to the office and go back to work. That's what you did before. You know, it was okay before. Why not make it okay now? You know, you see your loved ones when you come home from work. Yeah. And you, you go to work. You're with your colleagues. You can make new friends at your job. Yeah. It's a change of environment. There's, you know, many people will be very happy to get out of the house. So you have to adjust a little bit. But isn't that the mind that doesn't like to adjust? Isn't that part of our mind that has unrealistic expectations that things should always be exactly the same? Circumstances shouldn't change. I shouldn't have to adjust. Well, we always have to adjust. Yeah, and adjusting is not, it's not terrible. Yeah. there's many good things that come out of it. So enjoy the good things. Okay, Venerable. Uh, this question has to do with a lot of things that we are so used to. So for some people, their conditions such as financial, 
mental health, emotion, and physical, etc. And their relationships with their families, friends, bosses, employees, etc. might have been seriously severed during the long and widespread pandemic, which may be beyond salvage. How do they rebuild everything before they lost their hopes and commit suicide? We have our own limitations, but how do we help them within our limited means? Okay. Let me just see. I couldn't hear the, the whole question. Um, Would it me to repeat? Or maybe somebody, somebody here understand the question. Nobody seems to have understood the question well. I think um, it's about um, the okay. well-being of a person. Oh, hold on a second. One person, maybe, yes? Yeah, it's the one about how because extended period of the pandemic, all our regular relationships with workers, colleagues, friends, family have all been severed. And all the things we're used to are no longer with us. So how can we rebuild the lives that we know um, before we lose hope and suicide? And how do we help people in those situations, even though we have limitations? I see. Okay. So um, first, you have to ask yourself, do you really want to go back to how your life was before COVID? This is one of the things that's happening a lot, is people are beginning to question that. You know, my life before COVID, was it really that great? Do I really want to go back to the way it was before? And some people are coming up with the answer of no, there's other things that are more important to me than, uh, be, than I thought were important to me before COVID. And so they're, they're trying new things. They're reaching out, they're exploring new things. So again, don't have the thought that I wanna go back and try and make my life exactly what it was before, because you can't make your life exactly what it was before, okay? Things are changing all the time. The Buddha told us this, we just keep forgetting, okay? But you don't have to get nostalgic for the past and want to have your relationships be exactly the same. You don't need to have your schedule, your daily schedule be exactly what it was before. You know, as, as you are coming out of COVID, you make new friends. You find new ways to relate to your family and to your old friends. Maybe you read some new books, you have new hobbies, okay? So, uh, you know, let yourself be kind of curious about life. Let yourself just look at things and see possibilities instead of just saying, oh, you know, my life used to be so organized like this and now it's not, you know. Well, that can be really good. Because when our life is super organized and we have everything in boxes, very often we aren't really alive. We're just going through the rote motions of doing what we think we should be doing or what we think society thinks we should be doing. So now is a really nice time to explore, you know, and even you're redeveloping friendship with people that you haven't seen since COVID began. Well, that's nice. They're different people now. You can have some really interesting discussions about how you both handle COVID. Okay. So, you know, there's lots to be do of life is very interesting. Let yourself find it interesting because it is interesting. Okay, very well. Our last two questions are about karma. So do okay. you think the pandemic was the result of negative collective karma? Uh, yeah, I think that the, well, the, there's many causes, okay? I don't think our negative karma 
cause the virus, okay? The virus, the cause of the virus happened biologically. The spread of the virus depended on, you know, the wet markets and people traveling and all this. What does depend on karma is why are we here in the middle of the, of the pandemic? Yeah. Why are we personally experiencing that? So that has something to do with our collective karma. Okay. And so while we're in this collective karma, experiencing the result of it together, we're also creating more collective karma by how we respond to the situation. Yeah. So as much as we can respond in a positive way, in a way that encourages people, um, then that encourages more people and encourages more people. And uh, we can spread the creation of merit. Mm. We can't hear you, Xiao Hong. Huh? Yeah, Xiao Hong, we still can't hear you. No, we still can't hear you. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, is it bad karma if my job require me to directly or indirectly kill harmful insects and summon people? Kill har harmful, harmful insects. Insects and do and what to people? That means fine others. Giving fines. Just, uh just giving fines. tickets, giving tickets, it, it do fines, giving fines to people. Yes. So oh, is it oh. a bad karma? Okay. Well, from a Buddhist viewpoint, taking life does create negative karma. Okay. Um, if you have regret when you take life, the karma is not as serious, but it's still negative. Uh, if you purify afterwards, uh, again, you, you lessen the weight of the karma. So if you're in situations uh, where you do create negativity, you know, be sure and apply the four opponent powers and purify. In terms of giving tickets to people who don't, uh, like what? Um, spray their homes to kill the bugs? Is, is, that, is that what the question is? Yeah, okay. Um, I would, I don't know, you know, I would rather have another job than, than one that encouraged the killing of insects. Uh, so I don't know that I can really respond to that question very well. Thank you, Baba, for your precious teachings. And brothers and sisters, we hope that you have enjoyed and benefited from Venerable's teaching. I believe some of us might have heard of the building of the Buddha Hall. And some of us might be new to it. So a brief introduction of this project. The Buddha Hall is a long-awaited temple space the crown jewel of buildings of Swarovski Abbey. No monastery is complete without its Buddha hall. And while our beautiful log cabin meditation hall has served its purpose well for 17 years, it was always a temporary solution. And now with a resident community of 17 monastics and pre-COVID attendance at Abbey, programs regularly surpassing 50 people. The meditation hall is just too small to contain all the Abbey's Dharma activities. When the Abbey opens up again, 
we expect an even greater surge of people seeking methods to cultivate peace. The Buddha Hall will be a two-story, 17,000 square foot temple and the library, a spiritual home for all beings. It will be the center of spiritual practices and Dharma education for monks, nuns, and lay visitors too. The Buddha Hall welcome the Sangha of the Ten Directions and will be built to last for thousands of years. A tribe of kind donors invited every friend to match their 250,000 challenge gift by July 14 to jumpstart the building project to begin summer 2021. May we invite everyone to join us in this meritorious act of supporting the building of Buddha Hall. So, Venerable Children, would you like to say a few words about the Buddha's Hall? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you kind of said it all, Xiaohong. Uh, our, our meditation hall is too small. We need bigger spaces. Right now, the teaching that you're listening to is in our dining room because we don't have the ability to uh, live stream or have Zoom in our current meditation hall. Uh, and the dining room is the biggest uh, room. So a lot of teachings are happening in the dining room right now. Uh, it would be really nice that if the dining room could be a dining room. And if we had the other uh, rooms where for our meditation, for our Dharma teachings, for our classes and so on. We're also very short of uh, office space. And so the, the new Buddha hall will have office space. So we won't be all sitting on top of each other as the community grows. And uh, what else? Oh. Our library, right now, our library is like crammed and it's very difficult to find materials in it. In the Buddha Hall, we have uh, plans for a nice large library with seating areas, with a, um, you know, a computer system where we can uh, find the books easily and, uh, you know, which will be very, very nice and, and very helpful. So it's really going to be a building that's well used and used for a long period of time. So for us, it's really kind of exciting uh, to build it and to watch all the, all the pieces come together because there's so many people involved in building this. You know, there's many engineers and our architect and the contractor and all of us here trying to make decisions and you know, people all over the world giving $5, $10, 5000 10000 You know, it's just, it's, it's a way for people to get in touch with their own goodness and, and to support something that's going to create uh, the physical space where many people can practice the Dharma and progress on the path to awakening. So we invite you all to contribute and we invite you to all come here and, uh, you know, meditate with us and hear teachings at the Buddha Hall when it's, it's completed. Um, a Kai volunteer from the Abbey has spent a lot of time and effort to develop a video of this project. So let's watch the video together. is the largest building that we will ever build. Its function will be the centerpiece of the community in terms of the religious life. All the practices, the teachings, and every, most everything will happen there. I think this is going to be the most beautiful building that we've ever built. So do we still need a Buddha hall? At some point, we will open to guests. We definitely need it for the guests. And our community is also growing even during COVID, 
and we really need the space. The Buddha Hall will be a spiritual home for all living beings for a long, long time to come. And it will allow for the monastic community to continue to flourish and grow. There's a future monastic. The monastics uh, have a place to meditate. You have places to study. Uh, we have a bigger library. We have a modern library being able to uh, stream more teachings worldwide as webinars, as in Zoom, uh, so that we can get the teachings out more. And then, you know, just so more people can come here. I'm thinking that uh, if it's possible, we still need to, to check out some details and so on. But I think it, if it's possible, it would be good to start the construction this year. Actually, I do think now is a good time to start this building. You know, we're ready to go in that regard. Yeah, the sculptor is already working on the statues in his workshop in France. His name is Peter Griffin. He is currently working on the two standing statues that are going to be on our main altar. So that's of uh, the Venerable Ananda and the Venerable Mahaprajapati Gautami, who is the first Buddhist nun. And, and then in the middle will be Shakyamuni Buddha. But he's beginning with the standing statues on the main altar. Well, we've been working with Threshold Acoustics. They specialize in creating spaces where sound, where music happens and works. Our goal for this whole thing is clean, clear, beautiful sound. And the other thing is that we'll be using a commercial general contractor. The, the name of our general contractor is John Young. Well, he has a lot of talent. He's done churches, he's done facilities like ours, and he understands our constraints. It will actually, it will take us less time. It will save us money. They go so fast. We're hoping to have everything, all the 100% of the plans done in time to be able to build this year. So even though people have been so happy to have the Abbey to turn to uh, during COVID time, and we've been doing so many more things online now than we ever have before, but to you know have a place like this now for this generation and future generations where people can come and they can learn from teachers in person, they can have group discussions in person with people. Yeah. Uh, this is a whole different level of really learning and practicing the Dharma. And uh, it needs desperately to continue. We cannot replace everything just uh, by online. I think that this is going to be a, just a beautiful building. I think when uh, the pandemic's done and people can come here, they're really going to enjoy it. I think it'll be an excellent home for the Dharma. And I hope all of you will come here and practice together with us um, so you can also receive some direct benefit from building the Buddha Hall. Wow. wow, what a nice and touching video about the Buddha Hall. Yes, together we'll build the Buddha Hall. We look forward to your support to join us in this project.